Now it's time for our interview with Jonathan Williams. Um, Jonathan founded the Alex Center for State Fiscal Reform in 2011 and co-authors Rich States, Poor States, Alec Laffer Economic State Competitive Index with Reagan economist Dr. Arthur Laffer and Stephen Moore. Prior to joining Alec, Williams served as staff economist at the Nonpartisan Tax Foundation, authoring numerous tax policy studies. His work has been featured at the federal level by the White House, the Congressional Joint Economic Committee, and the U.S. House Committee on Ways and Means. Jonathan, welcome to Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. And uh, as always, greetings from the land of make-believe here in Washington, D.C., and it's getting more in that way, unfortunately, all the time, it seems like right now. Yeah, ab absolutely. Before we actually even jump into any questions, Let's start by saying, what is ALEC, <laughs> yes. right? I think that's a good set. ALEC stands for, Jonathan? Yes, that's the right question. What is ALEC, not who is ALEC, right? It's <laughs> not ALEC Baldwin. It's exactly. ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and we are the, la the nation's largest uh, nonpartisan individual membership organization of state legislators, and uh, just celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, here, and just an incredible time to reflect back on five decades of working on free market wow. principle policy solutions at the state level and limited government and federalism. Those are really the core ALEC principles, and our members from the public sector and job creators on the private sector. I know we've worked very extensively, I know, with, uh, with you all and the great work of JCN over the years to bring the private sector and job creators to this discussion, but ALEC is an organization that is unlike any other, but created around these principles to pursue good public policy in the 50 laboratories of democracy, as we like to say. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, we really appreciated the uh, friendship and the partnership, Jonathan, and uh, working with yourself and Lisa Nelson, your CEO, which I think we're going to have on a, a podcast in a few weeks. Uh, so we're excited about everything that we're doing, but uh, let's just jump into it because we're hearing our president, President Biden, going around the country talking about how great the economy is, how things are wonderful, couldn't be better. I mean, is that the truth or is he kind of uh, fibbing a little bit? Well, you know how I always say Washington's the uh, land of make-believe, right? And this is a key reason why. If you have people like the president and like Leader Schumer and like others uh, trying to really tell the American public how great things are when you go to the grocery store, you go to the gas station, and I think it's getting back to that question that Ronald Reagan asked all those years ago, are you better off today than you were four years ago, right? And I think the answer to that is a resounding no for most Americans, right. uh, whether uh, you want to sugarcoat the uh, monthly and inflation numbers, whether you want to sugarcoat unemployment numbers, other things to look at. I think the vast majority of Americans feel and realize and see the data for themselves that you know their real wages are actually gone down substantially during this administration because of this insidious tax of inflation, right, that we've yeah. seen because of all this printing of new dollars, the $5 trillion of new spending that's above and beyond even just the incredible wasteful spending that we had in Washington pre-pandemic. And now, of course, the discussion in Washington is really around how to change it at the edges right now versus, you know, a wholesale we, you know, uh, imagining how we want to spend and budget at, at the federal level. And of course, all this bad news flows downhill to the states and local governments, as I know we want to talk about. But it's very clear, Washington doesn't have a problem with a lack of tax revenue. Washington has a problem that they spend too darn much. And uh, this is something that is such a dis different disconnect for those of us who follow the state level, where 49 of the 50 states, as you know, have balanced budget requirements in their state constitution or by state law. And Washington, D.C. Uh, isn't even getting close to even discussing something towards a balanced budget. And so uh, this is where I think you just see this disconnect. Most families are kitchen table budgeting. Most small businesses obviously have to, to budget accurately or they're out of business. And they see this Washington, D.C. way of budgeting and it's a total uh, disconnect. And I think that's one of the biggest issues for this administration is you can you know, have a great spin and a great story on saying, you know, hey, we're on a rebound of some sort. Cherry pick the data uh, it just doesn't match up with reality, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't. With thirty three trillion dollars, I think, is what we just passed in terms of our uh, our debt. Uh, I mean, it's it's just out of control and doesn't seem to be stopping. I mean, you mentioned a, 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 a balanced budget, uh, something that we've been talking about. And I know you and I have had conversations about this, but isn't it time 
that we actually have a constitutional balanced budget amendment? It, it is far past time, right? I mean, this is something that was, of course, part of uh, Speaker Gingrich's contract with America. We came up just short in the 1990s with that effort yeah. on a balanced budget requirement to add it to the federal constitution. It, it is uh, something that we absolutely need to do. And, you know, just think about the $33 trillion that you mentioned, that we just hit that incredible, uh, just devastating threshold. And then you look at the 10-year estimates under current baseline projections in the Biden administration's uh, numbers to say that we're going to be at 42 or 43 trillion over the next 10 years if everything continues as planned. I mean, that's not tenable in any scenario, but especially, as you both know well, given this new world that we live in of interest rates and uh, where 10-year treasuries are today, the cost of borrowing now for the federal government and for all of us for tax uh, dollars going forward, uh, we're going to be spending more on just servicing the debt through interest payments than we will, let's say, in the next 10 years on the entire Department of Defense and uh, national security readiness. I mean, so these are just terrifying trends that we see, and that is something that we absolutely need to learn from the states where this is done a commonplace, 49 out of the 50 states. And then we have to have a real discussion around not just balancing a budget like California does on paper, but actually really balancing a budget and limiting spending. Right. Like Colorado with their Taxpayers' Bill of Rights and their state's constitution. Lots of great examples from states that we can learn from as we craft this federally. Jonathan, just for our listeners, help help them understand what 33 trillion really means right. in terms of their everyday lives how is that affecting our economy well, I mean, uh, it's affecting our economy uh, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the gas station, right? And every part of our life is we're paying that right now in terms of the inflation payment on it. And then we're going to have to pay it again when we actually either reduce other areas of spending to pay off debt. There's going to be a crowding out effect or there's going to be massive tax increases. And I think if you look at the current uh, folks in Washington, uh, as the President Biden and Leader Schumer, if it was up to them, they would increase taxes dramatically. I mean, heck, you even had the comment from AOC this week saying that back home in New York, she wants to double income tax rates in the state of New York. I mean, that's the philosophy right now of the progressive left is they're not content on you know, even controlling the growth of spending. They actually want to double down on this and have a scenario where in a decade we're going to our kids and our grandkids are going to be seeing a scenario where we're at 42 trillion. And, you know, beyond that, you know, maybe modern monetary theory and uh, minting trillion dollar coins is their fantasy land solution. But there is clearly no Play to, uh, to reduce spending from that side of the political spectrum right now. All their solution is is doubling down on more spending and then raising taxes to try to make up the difference, which, is, as we know well, your members know as job creators, every time the United States has done that, uh, we have not seen the kind of revenue because it stifles economic growth. So there's really no way out from the progressive kind of uh, faux solution set that they're proposing. Well, we all remember when Ronald Reagan stated those famous words about, you know, the uh, the the, uh, the uh, words you don't want to hear uh, people say in terms of uh, you know the government's here to help, um, but now there's actually three words that are really scary. You just mentioned them: modern monetary theory. Um, walk us through because that is a really scary concept. You and I understand it as economists, but I think the average person hears that and go, "What the heck is that? And why is it going to hurt us so much? And why is it that AOC and Janet Yellen and Bernie Sanders?" And all those radical left wingers believe in modern monetary theory. Well, you know, Alfredo, I know it's a, it's kind of a nebulous concept, right? And the modern monetary theory throws out any kind of rules of any kind of monetary uh, historical background that there is, right? And, and going back a hundred years, of course, we actually had gold backed currency in the United States, where it actually meant something. There was real value behind uh, what we are. Uh, producing as a currency in the United States that has been eroded, as you know, by FDR and then even further later on in the 1970s. And so even, you know, some would criticize that the dollar is that, you know, it's a fiat currency. It's not backed by anything uh, of real uh, tangible value, such as gold in the old days. But that was a real check and balance on the limit of government growth, right? I mean, you see almost a direct uh, trajectory change when their uh, gold backing was removed from the United States dollar. And then it allowed government to continue to spiral out of control. And we've seen that play out. You know, that was a progressive era move to do that, really. And over the last century, we've seen that just horrible results uh, when it's not backed by something like gold. But 
you, know, you look at modern monetary theory, takes that to a whole nother level and just out of thin air uh, decides that we're going to uh, print these, you know, trillion dollar or mint to trillion dollar coin and say that the Federal Reserve has that kind of uh, new spending power. And it, it's just fantasy land thinking. I mean, as an economist, it almost blows your mind as to like how somebody could come up with the concept and yeah. actually you know, use it as a substantial policy uh, discussion point. But I think, you know, the other point uh, on that is it just gets away from the common sense uh, budgeting that is really needed. And Washington is already really good at doing that. You add this fantasy land thinking to modern monetary theory, and it really takes it to the next level, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, the the president keeps running around saying that he's cut, you know, one point five or one point six trillion dollars off the deficit since he took office. Uh, Explain to our viewers what's actually happened there. Well, that's uh, that's another good that's another good fast one by the administration. Right. But I mean, you look at what the overall, you know, the deficit can be a challenging thing to measure because it's based based on baseline assumptions, right, of spending and growth lots of different factors. And so I don't put a whole lot of uh, confidence in those kind of uh, those kind of numbers. But when you look at the overall debt, let's say, and, and moving up to 33 trillion, I mean, uh, what was it the start of the Biden administration? I mean, we're talking about a substantial increase in national debt, inc- incredible increase in federal spending with five trillion added in spending on just on the federal piece throughout the pandemic. But, you know, I've been doing this long enough to remember during the financial crisis, you know, at the beginning of the uh, the Obama era, you know, they had a, a national debt uh, number that was under ten trillion dollars. We've gone from that nine trillion plus that we thought was a real problem back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, to thirty three trillion today. Uh, any kind of argument made by this administration <clears throat> or the big spenders in Congress to say that there's been any kind of cut. And deficit or debt uh, really is you know trying to cherry pick the data once again. No, uh, it, it it really is, and it's just incredible. You know, we, when we were, we've been talking a little bit too about, um, and and it seems esoteric and kind of in the weeds, but I think it's an important concept for folks to start understanding, which is what's happening with the dollar on on the world, uh, kind of from a world perspective, and the yuan. Right. And what the Chinese are doing in terms of international trade with some of our, uh, you know, some countries across uh, the board uh, worldwide and and what that's going to do to the dollar, which is basically a devaluation of the dollar. How is that really going to become a major issue for us? Walk us through that. Well, you know, this is something that I think should keep a lot of us up at night. It keeps me up at night as an economist in that. You know, if we lost, let's say, the United States dollar has been known as the world reserve currency uh, for really decades yep. uh, since the British uh, pound lost that status, really coming out of the World War II uh, economic shambles, of course, that London was uh, facing at the time. And, uh, you know, if we had a scenario and this is a real threat right, where we have our, some of our adversaries working with other developing nations around the world, the BRIC countries, uh, for instance, looking to develop their own uh, type of currency that may be even gold backed, as I mentioned earlier, is that's a real uh, a real upside for those looking at certainty and value. It's, of course, something that's uh, needed within a currency. And that's, sorry, that's, Brazil, together, that's Brazil, Russia, India and China, correct? That's right. Right. Exactly. And so Russia and China probably wake up every day looking at ways to try to dethrone the dollar from that type of international standard because of some of the sanctions uh, that are allowed to be successful because of the dollar is the reserve currency across the world. And so to avoid that, to you know really w- look at ways to weaken the United States, I think that's a clear uh, a way that uh, the strategy that those two countries especially are, are trying to put together. And then you add in major population centers such as India and uh, Brazil uh, with the new uh, really leftist uh, leader down in Brazil, as you know, and with Lula winning his uh, election uh, recently there. And there's a real threat to the United States dollar. If there's somehow able to cobble together a currency that is uh, that people would trust, let's say. That's a big if, I know, at this point. But if it were to be backed in some way by gold or some other sort of real physical backing, uh, that could be the kind of thing that, given the trajectory of the spending problems, the debt problems in the United States, that we, that we devalued the dollar because we've monetized the debt that way. Um, that is something that if the United States lost the reserve currency status, um, that is catastrophic for the future of the United States. I mean, you add that to the issue of the the, uh, the interest rates where they're at today, yeah. that's going to be really hard to recover from, unfortunately. 
I'm glad, I'm glad the good note. Uh, <laughs> I am known as a happy economist, you know, and it's because, you know, I, I spend most of my Excuse time. Excuse me, I'm going to have to leave now. There's a bridge I think I'm going to jump off of. That's right. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I, I spend most of my time talking about state issues, though. You know, this federal stuff is really difficult. It's really doom and gloom. It's, you know, the best case scenario in recent years, as you all know well, has been gridlocked in Washington, D.C. Right. Uh, relative to the progressive left and what they would like to do with modern monetary theory and overspending and other things. I will say the mainstream media federally spends all their time and you know, the New York and, and D.C. Uh, corporate media spends all their time following Washington and following what's going on in New York. They don't follow what's going on in the 50 state capitals, though. And the story that's going on in the states is a very positive story because just as our founders intended with our 13 colonies, which became the states, and states created the federal government, not the other way around, they wanted the, the states to have this autonomy and this ability to compete with each other, right? So essentially 50 free trade zones that we have across the United States competing. And it's awfully clear when the states do compete with each other that these ideas in Washington that are being followed also by Sacramento and California and by Albany and New York and Springfield and Illinois, those ideas don't work when they have to compete with freedom-based free market pro-business ideas that are being pursued in Texas and the free state of Florida and in Tennessee and states that really value the different approach to government, and that is limited government, free markets, and federalism, the ALEC approach. And guess what? When you juxtapose those two different uh, really conflicts of visions, if you will, between a big government high tax, high spend vision and lower taxes and limited government. Uh, the proof's in the pudding. You know, our rich states, poor states report every year tracks how Americans continue to vote with their feet and leave high tax states uh, and go to states that value economic opportunity and real abilities for job creators to go and be prosperous. And so if, if there's something that I think is positive to take out of all this na really negative national news and the economy and the overspending and all the problems in Washington is that our founders, uh, you know, they were pretty ahead of their time in that, you know, let's design this unique American experience that then a hopefully then limited federal government would learn from these laboratories to say what works and what doesn't work. Right. And, you know, the solutions here are not all that uh, difficult. As Art Lapper, our friend, always likes to say, this is not rocket surgery. This is basic economics that we need to follow that will get us out of the problems in Washington, D.C. We just need to take a clue of what actually is working in the states that are prosperous today. Well, I live in the free state of Florida, and I can tell you that for a long time, we have always seen people from the Northeast and some of the high tax states up there move to Florida. But we have seen them come in droves, drove after drove after drove. I mean, our state is packed um, following COVID because they weren't just coming for low taxes anymore. They were coming for freedom. Um, freedom from mask mandates, freedom from vaccine mandates, uh, freedom, freedom to go out into the parks, freedom to do what they wanted to do. Um, and they're leaving those states. And there was a lot of concern by a lot of Floridians that people would bring their um, politics with them and change the state. And what we've seen is they they got it and they have no intention of changing the state. Yeah, that's, I mean, as I go around the country, I've been in about 35 states this year talking with state legislators on policy issues. And that is a usually number one question I get after talking about rich states, poor states, and this vast migration of, you know, nearly a thousand people per day going to the state of Florida on net from the other 49 states over the last year. Uh, California is almost a mirror opposite of that with a thousand people per day leaving to one of the other 49 states. And they wonder about, you know, this issue of, you know, real concern for the political uh, types of, you know, what is that going to mean for the future of politics? Well, and the good news is, and, you know, it's not a partisan conversation here, but people that go uh, across state lines, the number one reason why an individual moves we know this based on really good survey data, is for economic opportunity. And when you combine that with personal uh, freedoms that are being offered by these states that are valuing limited government by the fact that they kept their schools open, they kept their businesses open, they kept people's livelihoods, they kept their churches open. But then also now you add to that mix, you know, Florida is one of these uh, about a dozen states now that have universal school choice, yeah. for instance, that are not only attracting people coming into their state for no income tax and lower taxes and 
better regulatory climates for businesses, but for families with school-aged children that don't want to be sending their kids to public education because they don't believe in the values or the bad economic standards and, and the safety issues in many cases around the country. Uh, but also now that they have an opportunity to go to a private or charter school or homeschool with the ability to have resources to craft that educational approach that's best for their kids. I mean, that is the ultimate American dream when you combine yeah. better business environment with more school opportunities like Florida and states across the country are. I think that's the magic uh, sauce, really. That's the secret sauce of states that's going to be really successful going forward. And it's an under, I think, stated point in that, uh, you know, nobody in the past had really connected the dots on migration with education before. But I think it's such an important story going forward. No, it, it really is. And I know we've been talking a lot about this wonderful body of work and publication, Rich States, Poor States. You want to talk to us a little bit more about that, about that study? Yeah, so this is 16 years now in the works that we put together the annual report, uh, co-author with Art Laffer and, and Steve Moore, our good friends and economists. And we wanted to put together this report really for state policymakers, but also just concerned Americans across the board and business right. owners as to how does your state rank versus the other 49 when it comes to key economic criteria that will drive future growth and health of a state and uh, prosperity for people. And uh, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to really uh, put some uh, nonpartisan framework together. We haven't changed the variables over 16 years. So we have an incredible time series now to be able to show either progress or lack of progress for states. And so we rank the states based on 15 factors, as you all know, things that we know matter for economic growth, but also just as importantly, things that state policymakers and capitals across the country directly control, because there's so many of these surveys and rankings out there today, it can be a little bit uh, confusing, but ours is actually rooted in good economics, first of all. And secondly, it's practical in that legislators control these things. And so what uh, what we find, though, is an awfully strong correlation between states that rank well in our economic outlook scores and actual economic performance. And that, that was very, we figured based on the theory that would be the case, but now in 16 years worth of data, it's uh, borne out to be the case. And Utah, for instance, is the number one ranked state in rich states, poor states, and it has been for all 16 years, believe it or wow. not. It's an incredible economic track record and success story. But when you look at the census data over the last 10 years, as they used it for the reapportionment after the 2020 census, mm -hmm. the fastest growing state in America over that decade, Utah. Uh, it was also a state that became a flat tax state in the last uh, 15 years since we started writing the report. It was a state that reformed their pension system with, you know, you see these stories of state and local bankruptcies, potentially in Illinois and others that are just struggling mightily with these uh, union-backed uh, pension systems that are just going belly up in many yeah. cases. Uh, Utah got ahead of the curve on that. They hit the property tax conundrum, right, that's hitting all of us with these rising assessment uh, problems right. all across the country. Utah got ahead of that. I mean, there's so many great free market success stories from states at the top, but it's not just Utah. I mean, you've got North Carolina, you've got Arizona, you've got so many states that have moved up substantially over time. Uh, and that's been a great thing to be a part of because it's the men and women of ALEC that have been fueling those policy wins in those states that have been getting it right over the last 16 years. And of course, I don't want to go into doom and gloom. There's a lot of bad news there too, The California and New York, the out-migration problems continued wanting to raise taxes and raise spending. But that contrast, as I mentioned earlier, between states is essential. Now, I'll, uh, one other thing in the Biden administration, I think that ties in really well here. If there's a common thread of this Biden administration, it is other than being just big government and, uh, and high tax uh, proponents, is they want to limit, it seems like almost at every turn, the ability of states to compete with each other, whether that's telling states they couldn't take the, you know, cut taxes if they took the money, whether that's telling states uh, they shouldn't have right to work laws, whether it's wanting to federalize elections, that's the common thread of this administration is because when states compete with each other, Americans win, taxpayers win. And that's dangerous to those that want big government solutions. Who is ranked last in rich states, poor states? It won't be a surprise uh, based on what we've been talking about here and what you all know, but New York, uh, 50th out of 50, they've been at the bottom of the rankings almost every edition. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, maybe a couple of years Bernie Sanders, Vermont, to kick them out for temporarily. Uh, but New York has just been the epitome of what not to do outside of California if now for the last 16 years. So I'm not sure if it's just coincidence, but rich states, poor states 
is almost translate into red states, blue states. Is that correct? Well, you know, I'll tell you what, and when I started doing this uh, 16 years ago, uh, there were a whole lot more Democrats elected out there that were free market and more conservative on some business issues. And unfortunately, because of the AOC wing of, of the Democrat Party, they've been either primaried out or scared out of office. And now you have almost a monolithic anti-business high tax uh, scenario now on the left uh, where you don't have that diversity of viewpoints like you did even 15 years ago. And so I think you do see today many states that are governed by Republicans uh, today at the top of the rankings. Uh, I will say there are some exceptions. You know, you have some Democrats uh, recently in Connecticut that uh, cut taxes this session under Governor Let Ned Lamont. I was up there doing an event, and that was a notable exception of a blue state that realized, hey, we got to start cutting taxes. We've seen too much out migration. Uh, and then you've had other governors on, on the Democrat side. Uh, Jared Polis, for instance, publicly has called for the ill elimination of the personal income tax. And so there's, uh, you know, some hope, I think I, this needs to be a bipartisan solution going forward. But you're right. Right now, the top 10 states are states that are governed by free market uh, legislators and governors. Interesting. And where can uh, our listeners go to find your report on red states, poor st or red states, <laughs> rich states, poor states? <laughs> well, you know, Hugh Hewitt called it red states, blue states <laughs> at our, uh, our 50th anniversary gala. It was a slip of the tongue, but to Delfredo's point, there is some correlation there these days. Uh, rich states, poor states org, And it's got all 16 editions of the report there, which is just a phenomenal resource. So you can pull up your state, how you've ranked every single year is well well as all you've, how you've ranked in every category every year. And it also, I will say, gives you an ability to go interactive and say, you know, if we had uh, my druthers and I had a magic wand and I became, let's say, a zero income tax state, I eliminated the income tax, what would that do to my ranking? It allows you to recalculate your ranking oh. as you're on our website. So it's a great tool for policymakers and concerned citizens alike. Now, uh, Jonathan, you, you quickly mentioned unfunded pension liabilities in some of these states. So how bad of a problem is that and why should we be worried about it? Well, it's a, it's a wonky area of policy, I'll tell you that. Um, and usually within about 10 seconds, if somebody's not a CPA or an actuary, you start talking about ex generally accepted accounting principles and unfunded pension liabilities, you've lost them and fiduciary rules and standards of uh, accounting, right? Uh, but it's so important because we, our new report that just came out, we've been annually studying and surveying the states on what are the unfunded liabilities state by state. You know, we now estimate now on average, uh, every man, woman, and child in the United States owes more than $21,000 in unfunded state pension liabilities alone. We're not talking about uh, the uh, any kind of federal plans. We're talking about the biggest 290 state and local wow. pension systems across the country. And so what, you know, what does that mean? It means in uh, a place like uh, Illinois, where they're some of the highest in the country, that means that dollars that are going to pensions are not being used to increase wages, let's say, for public employees, or they're paying some of the very highest property taxes in America to pay down liabilities. Oh. I mean, it could it could hit you in terms of higher taxes or reduced ability to hire new uh, people or actually right, pay right. people well as teachers. It's taking dollars out of the classroom and actually paying uh, those that have already worked and retired. And so mm -hmm. it's a huge issue. And in, Alfredo, you know this. I mean, it's a political economy problem where elected officials today get all the political benefit right. from making these promises, making the unfunded liabilities larger, and the bills come due in 20 or 30 years when they expect to be long gone and their successors are in office. Yeah, it's, it, it really is a horrible, horrible issue. Well, I'm glad that we have uh, Alec and the, the great work that you're doing there. And I want to thank you for joining us today on Main Street Matters, America's Small Business Megaphone. And for those of you listening, you can subscribe to the show anytime at salempodcastnetwork.com or wherever you get your podcast from. 